Today, we're going to discuss an issue that Positive Money has long sought to educate and raise awareness on, and which the coronavirus pandemic government's economic response has given us an opportunity to bring to the fore again and in new ways. We've been told by countless politicians over the last decade that there is no magic money tree. But as the Bank of England has proven time and again, this simply isn't true. In the last six months alone, the bank has used its power to create new money to pump over £18 billion into bailing out biz big businesses via its COVID corporate financing facility. It's now also done a decade of quantitative easing since the financial crash, which has proven to disproportionately benefit the rich and resulted in higher assets and house prices for everyone else. So let's imagine what we could do instead. Our economic recovery from COVID-19 gives us a rare chance to change everything. A Green New Deal, a four day week, a real living wage, universal basic income, a stronger NHS. Today, we're going to discuss how we really could build back better by unleashing some of the money and policies that are available to the government. So a quick introduction on the structure of the next hour. So we've got three fantastic speakers here today. They're each going to give a presentation for about seven minutes each before we then move into an audience Q&A for the second half of the hour. So please do submit questions via the Q&A function you should see at the bottom of your screen. We'll also be monitoring questions on the Facebook live comment section because we're also live, uh, live streaming on Facebook right now. So now I'm going to introduce our three speakers. Maeve Cohen is co-author of the recent report Towards a Feminist Green New Deal for the UK, which was done for the Women's Environmental Network and Women's Budget Group. She also co-founded the Post-Crash Economic Society and is the former director of Rethinking Economics, the international student-led campaign to reform economics education. She is currently campaign manager at Discover Economics, a campaign to diversify economics. Chaitanya Kumar is head of environment and green transition at the New Economics Foundation. He was previously head of climate and energy policy at Green Alliance in the UK. And prior to that, he was based in New Delhi as the South Asia campaigns leader for 350.org. He holds an MSc in Energy Policy for the Science Policy Research Unit at Sussex University. Finally, Denisha Kazi is Positive Money's Senior Economist. Economist. Prior to this, she worked as a Senior Teaching Fellow at SOAS, lecturing in heterodox economics. She has an MA in Development Economics and PhD in Economics for SOAS University. So welcome to all of our speakers and welcome to everybody who is joining us on this call today. We're really excited to be having this conversation. So I'm now going to invite our first speaker, Maeve, um, to, to share your presentation. Thank you so much. Yes, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm basically just going to talk about the report that uh, Rachel referred to on a feminist Green New Deal. So. We were asked to write this before COVID, but it's only become more and more relevant as COVID has unfolded. So we were asked to write this paper to contribute to the Women's Budgets Group's um, commission on um, a feminist economy. And during the general election, as I'm sure you can all remember, and generally since AOC in the US um, started talking about the Green New Deal again, there'd been a lot of noise around the Green New Deal, and I'm sure that most of you attending know what it is, but just to recap, the Green New Deal was a project with the twin aims of decarbonising the economy and reducing social inequality. And it's based around large scale state and private investment targeted at taking us down to net zero carbon, um, primarily through the decarbonisation of the large polluting industries of transport, construction and energy. Um, and this decarbonisation was to go hand in hand with the reduction of social inequality based primarily around job creation in these, in these new green industries. So when writing our paper, um, Sherilyn, my co-author and I were asking ourselves, great, that, that's, that all sounds good, but what, what does this new green economy mean for women? Um, and to answer that, we wanted to look at what had sort of got us into this mess in the first place. And I think um, environmentalists and ecological economists over the past 
decades have done a really great job of bringing awareness to the fact that the reason we're in this situation is because our economic system and our, the economic models that we use don't accurately consider the environment. So the environment is external to the market, it's an externality, the, the, the jargon, which means that it's, it's able to treat it as a free resource, as this inexhaustible free resource. And in doing that, we've completely de depleted the environment um, and that's why we're in this ecological crisis. A sort of less well-known um, analysis and a less, less well widely acknowledged truth is that the work done by ecofeminists and feminist economists that another externality is the caring labour done pri primarily by women, but also primarily by BAME people, by people in the global south and by people from a lower socioeconomic background. So this, this caring labour is also treated as an externality. It's outside of the market. It's treated as this, in, this free resource that we can, we can, um, we can just um, inexhaustibly use up. And that has meant that we don't only have an ecological crisis, we also have a crisis in care. Right. So back to the Green New Deal, we wanted to examine whether the Green New Deal plans that had been put forward in the UK reach this goal of social justice when being viewed in, in this context. And spoiler alert, <laughs> spoiler alert um, we found that they, they didn't. So care was noticeably absent from each of the plans that we looked at. Um, and each of the industries that they, that they did look at, that they focused on transport, construction and energy, in which this job creation would happen that would create that would that would get rid of this social inequality all of these industries are heavily male dominated so jobs created in these sectors would disproportionately benefit men and could actually contribute to the worsening of gender inequality and this is the exact opposite of the stated aims of of the green new deal so to rec to remedy this we recommended that as well as decarbonizing these high polluting sectors which is obviously super super important um, it is absolutely essential that we boost the already low carbon caring and service industries in which female people and their people and low income people are disproportionately represented in the UK. And we need to basically fundamentally, to do this, we need to fundamentally think, rethink what the economy is for, right? And to do that, it's not enough just to go green, right? We need to think about who bears the cost of greening the economy, right? So if we're all gonna to go to like locally produced organic food, which is totally essential, the food industry emits an insane amount of carbon. I think it's something like 26% of, of global carbon is from the food, the agriculture industry. But if we're all gonna to move to organic locally grown food, who is gonna prepare that food, right? It's a lot harder to prepare a meal from scratch. It costs a lot more labor to prepare a meal from scratch than to just bang it in the microwave, right? Is that where is that extra labour going to fall? If we move, if we ban single use plastics, that means banning disposable nappies, right? That means that caring for children is going to have massively more labour. Who is going to do that labour? It's not enough to just go green. We need to think about how we are going to redistribute labour after we have gone green or during the process of going green. So we need to completely rethink how we how we how we do our economics, right? And the, the New Deal, which the Green New Deal was based on um, at the start of the last century, was all based around the social contract of you go to work, you go into the factories, and as a, as a result, you will get all of these lovely consumption goods, right? Go to work and you can have a washing machine, you can have a car, you can have cheap holidays, right? We can't do this in, in a green economy. We need to completely rethink the social contract. And what we are putting forward in our paper is that that new social contract should be around care, right? You're not going to go to work and get more stuff. You're actually going to work less, but you are going to be supported. Your loved ones are going to be supported and cared for. You're going to have green spaces that you can enjoy a fuller and richer quality of life. And so back to the, the sort of initial question about the magic money tree and building back better. The magic money tree part of this is that we need the state to release funds. We need the state to invest in, in the caring industries. We need to, the state to invest heavily in decarbonisation. And the build back better part of it is that we need to recognise that care is a fundamental part of human existence. Every single one of us at some point in our life is dependent on, on care. And we need to be organising our economy around that. And that is, that's that. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much, Maeve. That was fantastically clear and insightful. Um, we're going to move straight on to Titania. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, 
I'm going to try and speak um, by, by sort of firstly laying out the context. And I want to start off with um, the PM speech yesterday. Um, if, if you saw the PM speech yesterday, you'd be forgiven, I think, for thinking it could, may have been given 15 years ago. I think it's the same old stale rhetoric around state versus private sector, unleashing the power of markets, downplaying the role of the state, same old sort of labor versus story tropes. Uh, and the, I mean, if I can be slightly cheeky and the invocation of sort of white men from 200 years ago that no one probably knows about, uh, which seems quite quite uh, typical of his speeches. But if I'm trying to be hopeful, uh, and I was listening to some of that speech, I'd like to think that he and the chancellor are just sort of playing to the gallery uh, of the conservative hardline uh, members and fiscal hawks that are actually but they're instead quite quite keen on, on borrowing more investing across the economy. But but I might be too hopeful there. So but nonetheless, that option still still exists. Um, but if I wasn't trying to read between the lines, one thing was fairly clear in all the speeches we've seen so far coming out of the party conference is the narrative around build back better is pretty pretty much there. Uh, we've seen it in speeches, we've seen it in the branding. Um, it's very clear that build back better is is at least from a rhetorical point of view, very clearly something that this government is quite keen on. Uh, NEF and a lot of other groups have started a program uh, and a campaign uh, back in June under the same headline, Build Back Better. And I want to sort of briefly speak to that um, and sort of key pillars that sit underneath that campaign. It currently has about 350 odd signatories. Some of you on this call uh, perhaps are already part of that. Um, and the goal is to sort of secure commitments from the government on three things, protecting livelihoods, creating jobs, and retraining or reskilling workers. Now, the government so far has focused on the protection piece of the last few months, but is unwinding the program, which we think will have disastrous consequences. Um, the focus on creation, it does exist, but the scale is incredibly poor. And what I think, it basically amounts to building back better, but very slowly. Um, the Retraining, reskilling aspect is also there, but there doesn't seem to be any sort of cogent plan around it. We've seen the kickstart scheme. We've seen things like the hiring of hundreds of thousands of coaches uh, across the country. These are sort of good initiatives, but they're quite limiting in the scale uh, that we need, really. Um, <clears throat> central to Build Back Better, we also think, is the investment agenda. I think that's the sort of crux of the conversation we're trying to have here. And one thing that needs to change if we if you need to achieve that, as NEF would like to think about this, is the fiscal rules have to change. They have to be modernized uh, for the 21st century. Things like limits to net public spending of 3% uh, of GDP is rather arbitrary, especially under current economic conditions. Now, we've seen a lot of countries, including the UK, suspend these rules, uh, but we're now clawing ourselves back out of that and, and using language again of like balancing the books and seeing that as a sacred duty and I think that is, again, quite dangerous. Now, you, you may have seen the headlines on the IMF coming out saying public investment by which nations has to increase. Uh, they stated, you know, sorry, my internet is a bit unstable. Um, I'll continue. Hopefully, you can still hear me. Um, you get a bigger bang for buck from public investment because investment by private firms is extremely low. Uh, we've heard similar statements by the Federal Reserve saying now is the time to invest and a weak recovery uh, can create a necessary hardship uh, for businesses and households across the country. So I think that's where we're at. There are sort of three things NEF and our partners are sort of trying to focus on, again, under the agenda of protect, create and reskill. Under protect, we're quite keen on on talking about the minimum income guarantee, something we published early in the year, where we're looking at a weekly payment worth 221 pounds per week uh, for any adult um, who's sort of not in any of the schemes that the government has at this point. We have calculated how much it might cost. All of these reports are up on our, our website. So that is something we're quite keen to push. On the create aspect, um, May have already spoke to this point. There's but we've written a report uh, basically calling for an investment of about 28 billion pounds over the next sort of 18 months or so that we think could create roughly half a million jobs. Now, this is in energy efficiency, energy networks, broadband, things of that nature. 
But of course, uh, it can't just be in those sectors. And we need to think much more broadly around social infrastructure that can create uh, another report coming out soon that can create, we believe, an equal number of jobs um, in the public sector. And the final thing around retraining, reskilling, the way we see it is the, the job support scheme that was announced a couple of weeks ago needs to have a strong element of free training and upskilling. If, if COVID has set in more motion structural changes to the economy and activity at the firm level, then the government has a clear responsibility for a just transition and helping people through it. Now, as with most things, we've seen the rhetoric around it, but the scale of the response again is, is rather lacking. Um, and, and the final thing uh, to say is we've again produced a, a piece of analysis just a couple of weeks ago, looking at the loss to working hours in the economy. And it tells a very interesting story. Um, what we've seen is places like the east of England has lost a lot more working hours, up to about 29%, while London saw a drop of only 12%, essentially suggesting London saw a smaller scale uh, economic slowdown than the rest of the country. So there are massive distributive uh, variations across the country in how, not just, not just how COVID is impacting, but also government policy in response to that and how it's actually rolling out. There are massive uh, disparities across the country and any approach, this protect, create, reskill approach that we're talking about needs to also look at the distributive uh, aspects of it. So I'll conclude just by saying, I think, I think the need for public investment is, is higher than ever before, um, but the government rhetoric is starting to turn the other way. Uh, and I think now is the time to really up the ante uh, just when the politics is turning against us. And I think the window is sort of closing and the next two months, where perhaps people on, these, on this call and, and others who've been working in this space really need to step up and, and push uh, uh, against that closing door and see what we can get. Otherwise, we may go back to, yeah, sort of boring old uh, approaches to fiscal and monetary policy that clearly got us into the mess in the first place, will clearly not get us out of this. Uh, that's it. Back to you, Rachel. Thank you, Chaitanya. And that was just bang on seven minutes, so brilliant timing. Um, and again, super interesting and insightful presentation. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move to our final speaker, Denisha. Hi, thanks, Rachel. Um, so hello to everyone and, um, and really great contributions by Maeve and Chaitanya. Um, hopefully mine will sort of complement what they've been saying. Um, so I'm going to really talk about what the magic money tree is and how we can use it. Um, it's essentially the fact that the state can finance public spending and investment through money creation. Um, with a little bit of background, I'll begin just sort of setting the scene a bit in the context. So after the global financial crisis of 2008, we were told there was no magic money tree and austerity was imposed. This basically crippled the recovery, placed the burden of the recession on those least able to bear it, and also weakened the economy in the event of future crises. Um, so that's what we've seen now, the dismantling of the social safety net and heavily under-resourcing key public services like the NHS and social care. So in sharp contrast to that, this time, what we've seen is unprecedented action by governments and central banks across the world. And this has involved creation of large amounts of money to prop up many economies. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about two key points, which is how the government can finance spending and investment through direct monetary financing, which is really what we're talking about, and why the government's current response is failing to achieve better social conditions and ensure the burden is shared fairly. And this is basically because the current response is centred around pushing the private sector, that's firms and households, to take on more debt as a way to weather the storm. Um, direct monetary financing can overcome that negative aspect. So um, we generally accept that government spending is financed by a combination of taxes and borrowing, but there is a third option, direct monetary financing. And this can be done in two ways. Um, what this means is the Bank of England um, creates new money and it gives it to the government to spend. Um, and this can be done by the Bank of England purchasing government bonds directly from the Treasury or by extending the government's overdraft facility at the bank, which is the Ways and Means facility. And interestingly, the Bank of England did do this back in April, recognising that it was going to be important and the um, scale of the crisis. Um, it's also useful to view direct monetary um, 
uh, financing in comparison to quantitative easing, which has been the standard approach since the global financial crisis. This is a more indirect form of monetary financing. And what happens here is the Bank of England creates new money, but it buys government bonds in the secondary market from non-bank um, financial firms. So things like pension funds and insurance companies, and it's giving them the money. So that's why it's indirect. Um, this year, the bank created 300 billion of new money through quantitative easing programs in response to the crisis. Um, so this is pumped into financial markets. Um, and um, the purpose of this was a little bit different this time. So in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, the purpose was to try and stimulate the economy, to put the money into those markets so that they can lend it out. And we saw that that didn't really happen. And um, this time it's been the real main purpose of it has to, been to keep demand for government bonds high, therefore keeping yields down. And that makes it easier for the government to borrow so they can finance their fiscal programs that we need right now, things like the furlough scheme. So I'm gonna talk about some of the advantages of direct monetary financing. Um, firstly, it avoids all the negative effects that we know come out of quantitative easing. That's um, pump, because pumping money into financial markets has led to increasing inequality, asset price inflation that Rachel had mentioned at the beginning, and it diverts, importantly, it diverts money away from the real productive economy where people earn their living and have you know, their income from. Um, and so, yeah, that's why we're seeing even now house prices have hit um, have been going up even now in this recession. Um, secondly, uh, the government wouldn't be dependent on financial markets to finance its spending, which I think um, speaks a lot for itself. Um, thirdly, the government will have no excuse for failing to, to meet the needs of people, their well-being and future crises such as climate change, unemployment, social care crisis. Um, and then finally, the government is actually responsible under these conditions to make sure we have better social outcomes and um, it won't be relying on what it's doing now, which is leaving firms and households to rely on more debt to weather the storm and to meet their basic needs, um, which is an unsustainable um, approach. Despite all these clear benefits, um, the government and the Bank of England are still not willing to take full advantage of the direct monetary financing. Um, so this moves me on to my last point, my second point, which looks at the problem with the government's current approach. Um, the biggest problem with the current approach is it's more of the same. The government's response is basically to protect the interests of the asset rich and capital rich, while expecting households and small businesses to take on more private debt. Um, private debt is worrying because um, in increasing amounts of private debt is a basically a main source of financial instability. And this is what we saw with the global financial crisis. It was triggered by unsustainable private debt, not public debt. So direct monetary financing can um, circumvent this problem. And looking at a key snapshot of what the government's been doing recently, we're seeing key measures such as the furlough, furlough scheme and payment protection holidays on mortgages and other kinds of forms of debt, which have been important pro to protect jobs and incomes, they're going to be withdrawn now. And as unemployment rises, people are going to see their incomes collapse and dent and rent arrears um, skyrocket. Now, that means the vast majority of people are not benefiting from the government's current approach. Another example is the Treasury's business um, loan schemes, things like the bounce back loan schemes and the, um, the um, business interruption loan schemes. Now, this has totaled about 58 billion now that's been lent out. Um, essentially, these provide date back loans to businesses. They guarantee repayment by the government of 80 to 100 percent of the loan. So effectively, this is an implicit subsidy to banks. Not only are they guaranteed the loans will be repaid by the government, um, they get interest and fees paid by the government for the first year. Um, um, importantly, um, the downside to this is that small businesses are taking on more debt and at higher interest rates, sometimes up to six or eight percent, as well as the risk of default on their livelihoods. Um, and this could be an unsustainable problem in terms of the recovery. A final example, which Rachel also mentioned at the beginning, is the the COVID, the corporate COVID financing facility that was a scheme, joint scheme by the Bank of England and the Treasury to extend on very favourable terms, large bailouts to, corp to large corporations that were seen important in the economy. Um, they didn't attach any meaningful um, conditions on these loans, um, either environmental or social conditions. 
problematically what we've seen is vast amounts of money extended to them, newly created money, um, that at, while at the same time companies are making large scale job cuts, what's been estimated recently is something like over 50,000 redundancies across these companies that have taken loans and they continue to pay dividends. So what we're seeing is that some people are doing quite well out of this crisis. It's inflating house prices and stock market and the owners of capital and assets and large businesses, while others are being forced to take on more debt. And this is unsustainable. So just to end here, um, um, I'd say the state has the capacity to create money to directly finance the challenges we're facing and improve social outcomes, make sure the burden of these crises and these challenges are shared fairly amongst us. The government has to start taking advantage of all the tools it has, and that includes direct monetary financing. Um, and the risks for direct monetary financing are minimal, but the risks of inaction are very high. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denisha. Um, again, so much um, useful and insightful information in that presentation. Thank you to all of our speakers for, for all of that. We've got a rich discussion ahead of us. Um, so I can, I'm now just gonna segue us into the, the Q&A section and I guess just summarize some of the key things we've heard there. So May talked about the need to fundamentally rethink what the economy is for and what the social contract is. And within that, we need the state to release funds heavily in order to decarbonize and boost the care industry. Recognizing that care is fund a fundamental part or basis of our whole existence. From Chaitanya, we heard about what the the core of what building back better means in terms of reskilling, creating jobs and protecting livelihoods. And that the need for public investment is higher than ever right now, but the government, and rhetoric, the government rhetoric is going the other way. So now could be an important time for us to, to push against that. And Denisha outlined how Austerity crippled the recovery in our public services off the back of the financial crash. But there is a tool on offer to the government and Bank of England in the form of direct monetary financing. Um, but currently the government's response is to expect households to take on more debt whilst it protects the asset rich. And, and what you said right at the end there, Denisha, was so um, kind of, I guess, chilling in some ways that some people are really benefiting from the government's response to COVID whilst a lot of people are losing out substantially. Um, so thank you all again for those presentations. And now we're gonna move into the Q&A. We've got about 250 people out there listening to this call and watching um, and some fantastic questions coming in. Coming in. Um, so Peter Kahn says, I often think the phrase balancing the books equates a state economy with a household budget, as David Cameron so famously did off the, after the financial crash. Um, and it can put pressure on politicians to appear financially responsible. So what does the panel think is the best way to educate politicians and also the general public um, that a government debt isn't necessarily a reason to panic um, and reject? much needed state fin finance investment. So that's the first question. I'm gonna bundle three together and then, and then we'll go back to the panel, if that's all right. Julian's got a related question, which says, Chaitanya, why is it dangerous to balance the books? And Ronald Mendel says, Maeve, I found your presentation very provocative and novel. Can you elaborate on what you mean by the caring industry? Does it encompass not only child and social care, but health and education as well? So perhaps we could go to you, May, first on that question, and then and then perhaps the Chaitanya and then Denisha for this first round of questions. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, the caring industries, and also it's the caring and service industries, right? So these are all of the industries that we found to be incredibly important during this COVID crisis, okay? So yes, there's the, the industries, which is like the, the paid version of this. So that includes everything that you're talking about, like elderly care, child care, health care, education, 
um, the rest of it. But then there's also the service industry. So we've seen, obviously, we became incredibly, well, supermarket staff is a huge one. Delivery drivers is, is a huge one. These are already re relatively low carbon industries that we that we are, we fundamentally all rely on. And we saw that very clearly during the crisis. These were the key workers. These were the people that we realised that society couldn't function without. I mean, we, they shouldn't have needed a global pandemic to realise that these are the people that, that we fundamentally rely on. Um, yeah, so in answer to your question, yes, it includes that. But it's also not just the caring industries. An incredible amount of this work is done and is unpaid within the household. And that we've seen lots of horrific statistics about how badly lockdown has um, affected particularly women. So you've got people working from home and disproportionately women have been having to work from home and also care for, for children. Or obviously we know there's a gender pay gap um, and if somebody's going to have to stay home and look after the kids because the childcare um, service is gone, then it's going to be the person who has the lowest wages. So women have come out of work and pulled out of work to, to provide the childcare. So I, I did say caring industries, and I do mean those those caring industries that are in that are monetized. But I also mean um, care care provision, which is disproportionately done by women and that is unpaid for as well. Um, and then just I just wanted to say something on the on the first question as well. So um, how can we move away from um, the, well, saying to the public that we need to, to um, balance the books. I think we need to stop talking about balancing the books in general. I think there's just more, inc there's just more important things that the economy needs to do. Um, and I think sort of rather than meeting people where they're at and saying, this is why we don't need to balance the books or this is why we need to change the language around this. I think just, just we don't, we, obviously it's, it's something that we need to consider. People should be talking about it in policy circles, but this is something that the economy is not for it, we need to be thinking about what we want our economy economy to be working towards and providing us for and i i personally think that's yeah a healthy environment and a, and a healthy society chaitanya please come in sure um Thanks. yeah just to pick up from where I may have left uh sort of saying long thing which is right i mean if, if you're if we've, if we've been measuring the wrong things then the entire notion of balance in the budget seems a bit silly but but the, that's where we're at we're, the politics of the day means every time a politician goes on lbc or whatever news outlet they will be asked this question like how are you going to deal with the fiscal deficit how are you going to deal with a massive debt of 350 billion pounds and i don't think they have a cogent response and just saying we can borrow more, interest rates are low, which some have, I don't think, some, for some reason, doesn't feel like a satisfactory response uh, because it's, it's an easy thing to sort of beat politicians with uh, constantly. And I, I don't think we've figured out a way of responding to that. I, I genuinely do not think the, the civil servants in the treasury um, don't get this concept. I think they, they too, it, it's not rocket science. I mean, I'm not an economist, you know, but I, I, I get some of this. Um, so I, I think it, it's more on the media spin and the 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 language around needing to balance the books is, is, is quite critical. So I don't know. I don't know the clear answer to it, but a lot of it is emerging from just the media pressure, I'd say, just to respond to or clarify rather what I said earlier around dangerous or balancing the books being dangerous just to clarify i didn't mean balancing the book per se is dangerous i meant balancing the books at the expense of public investment um is is dangerous and i think we've seen that in the past uh 10 12 years ago and we can't risk seeing that again now the narrative of austerity is behind us i do not think we go down that path but um under investment is as bad as just cutting uh, public spending, right? So um, it can have dire consequences given we just sort of in some semblance of coming out of austerity last year, uh, some signs of that, but, and, you know, we can't just go back to that. So it's less about balance the books being dangerous per se. It's more about, I'm more worried about the investment uh, and, and, the, and the risk of losing that, uh, which is dangerous. Go for it, Denisha. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah. Um, I think it's a really important question. 
Um, it's um, disappointing to see it appearing so early on in our um, in the pandemic that we're still dealing with, that second wave is sort of coming or is already here. Um, it's um, very misplaced um, to be, it's misguided to be talking about this at the moment. So I agree with Maeve that we should try and change that conversation. Um, one thing I would say is to take the focus away from it is to, to really point out that private debt is more of an issue and it's, it is what the root of financial instability is. So we really need to be, instead of worrying about that, we need to be worrying much more about what's causing private debt to become unsustainable and the sort, the sort of roots of that. Um, um, another thing I, need, I, I quite like to say quite often is that we've actually sustained much higher levels historically of um, public debt than, than we are now. So after the World War, after World War II, public debt hit 250%. So um, debt as a share of GDP, um, 250%. And we also set up the welfare state at that time, which has had immense, immeasurable benefits to society. So we can do these things and this shouldn't be holding us back. Um, so yeah. Thank you so much. So the few, um, just loads of different questions come in, in, coming in here. We've got people as far as Edinburgh, from islands off of Scotland, from Chester, um, all around the UK. It's very exciting. Um, and I'm going to just ask three questions now that, that are are quite specifically about this idea of direct monetary financing and um, because there's a few different questions coming in on that so um so rosanna in edinburgh says um um she's wondering if universal basic income is part of this idea of di direct monetary financing secondly caroline white in ireland says are there existing examples of direct monetary financing in other countries and if so, what lessons can be drawn from them? And finally, um, a question from Jenny, what reasons do the Bank of England and the government give against direct monetary financing? Do, do we know that? And what can we come, be done to overcome these barriers? Um, so three connected questions there, and I'm gonna put them back to, um, to the panel and um, I can see Denisha and Titania writing away there. So um, either of you, please feel free to, to come in and, and comment on those questions and Maeve, of course, as well. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, that's fine. I, I'll leave the questions around direct monetary financing to you, Denisha. You've spoken to that and, and I'm sure you'll have answers to that. Um, just on just on UBI, I suppose universal basic services is, is how we've we've been thinking about it and have been writing at NEF. Uh, well, should be clear, my colleagues have been writing about it. Um, I've in my initial remarks, I've spoken to the point around a minimum income guarantee. The reason why we want to focus on that is we are going to enter a, an income crisis over the next few months uh, leading up to Christmas and, and beyond. Uh, people finding it difficult to pay their energy bills or rents or transport, things of that nature. So um, income is, is, is going to be quite, quite critical and ought to be the front and center of, of any of our campaigns, I, I, I'd argue. And therefore the, the point of our minimum income guarantee that we've uh, written about and advocated for in the past is something that NEF would push for. We've done some numbers around it. Um, as I've said in my uh, sort of initial remarks, around £221 per week is, 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 the, is the sort of uh, amount that we are advocating for. Um, and we've done some calculations, like I said, in terms of how much it might cost. I think about £20 billion over three months uh, if you had to do, if you had to sort of do that. And that figure isn't outrageous given, like, like I said, at how, how much we've been spending lately. But again, we fully understand it's a tough sell with this government. But yeah, just to answer that question, uh, minimum income guarantees is what we've been pushing for. Um, yeah, I, um, in terms of the um, first point about universal basic income, it's not um, sort of part, it's not exactly part of direct monetary financing, although some people's 
might call for um, direct monetary financing to fund universal universe basic income. Um, essentially, um, it's one of many different options that have been put out there, things like a jobs guarantee, the Green New Deal, um, and um, funding social care and health services. So um, that's a question for what priorities um, as a society we choose to focus on, our direct monetary financing on. Um, in terms of um, what reasons does the government and Bank of England give for not um, pursuing direct monetary financing? Um, one of the main reasons that's given is that it, it's this kind of mis kind of misguided view that it would lead to lead to uncontrollable inflation. That's generally what's said, um, and often a few kind of. Um, kind of extreme examples are given things like Zimbabwe as a as an example for what it would lead to but actually um we don't we know that conditions right now are not in line with that um, inflation being an issue inflation right now is 0.2 percent which is well below the government's target of two percent and in fact um most economies are facing deflationary pressures um as well as um, the fact that um, recently the Fed had actually changed its inflation targeting so that it was a range value rather than targeting a specific value, which is recognition that actually we probably need to have a little modest inflation. Um, so, um, sort of moving away from that, um, another reason is um, there's this been this tendency in the recent past to separate the bank monetary policy and fiscal policy. So the bank is in control, the central bank is in control of monetary policy and the, the treasury is in control of fiscal policy. And this idea of independence is seen politically as important and that they shouldn't be, um, shouldn't blur the lines. So that's another reason it's seen as um, not appropriate to kind of blur those lines. But um, one thing we do at Positive Money is say that we are sort of campaigning and advocating that actually better coordination between the Treasury and the Bank of England. Um, <clears throat> and this will actually be beneficial for the economy because they can actually make sure that the government has enough fiscal space to um, directly spend on the economy. Um, similarly, I just want to uh, come in on the on the UBI point. Um, just from from a sort of well, actually, there's obviously there's lots of feminists that advocate UBI, but from my perspective on this on this rethinking the economy around care, I think one of I would I would agree with Titania in an advocate for universal base, basic services um, rather than a universal basic income, based on the fact that one of the problems is this privatization of of what we call socially reproductive work, which is in like in short term in care work. And that's individuals paying for their own care, right? So if that works within a for, for profit model of, of caring provision, so care is quite unique um, as an industry. If you want to increase productivity in an industry, you have to increase um, the output for the amount of inputs you put in. But with um with caring, with caring labor, there's only the the the, the care is the labor, right? So if you you can't increase productivity without um Sorry, I've not explained this very well, and I had it in my head when I was going to say it, and now I've not done very well. But basically, right, you need to to increase productivity. You need to increase the amount of outputs for the same amount of time, right? In care, the the, the measure of output is time, right? That is the that the output is the amount of time you're caring for someone. So you can't increase that. It, there's a limit, right? You can only increase that by saying instead of caring for one person in an hour, I'm going to care for five person within an hour, and that that necessarily decreases the um the quality of the care or it increases um, or, or you can decrease the cost but cost of that labor which is obviously decreasing wages so care is quite unique in an industry in the sense that you can't increase pro productivity very easily without decreasing um, the quality of the care or decreasing the amount that you're paying people so i think we can't be working with care in a for-profit system we need to think of better ways to provide care um, and universal basic income sort of speaks to that individualization of care privatizing care we all pay for our own care it can work to some extent but it needs to go hand in hand with the provision of universal basic services and that's the socialization of care and and sharing sharing that um distributing that more fairly apologies that wasn't explained very well but i hope i got there in the end it absolutely was made um that was that was really clear thank you so much um and thank you for all our panelists for, for answering these 
questions that are coming in thick and fast and such a rich range of questions as well. So if, um, if we've all got the energy, I'm going to take a deep breath and ask us three more. Um, so Jonathan says, if the government had spent its 180 billion or is it 18 billion perhaps by giving money directly to people, what would the effects have been on the macro economy? Rachel says, as a mum of three who uses cloth nappies and tries to shop locally and organically, I'm super interested in the idea of a feminist Green New Deal and a care-based economy. To change our economic setup slash mindsets to achieve this, do we need to move away from the idea of perpetual growth? How would it work, basically, <laughs> she says. Um, and Alistair says, um, given that the pound and almost every other currency in the world is a debt-based currency lent into existence by bankers and bearing debt, is the idea that we can transform to a Green New Deal possible? Is it necessarily, is it necessary to completely reimagine the financial system with non-debt-based currencies? So three chunky and different questions there. Um, Maeve, are we able to go to you first um, and feel free to, to speak to any of the three questions there? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the one that was um, directed at me, I think. Um, yeah, I think that um, all of these things that are going to... So when I was talking in my presentation about the increased labour in these areas, um, yeah, changing nappies, pre preparing food. These are all like burgeoning industries, right? You can create jobs around these things, sustainable and, and, and decently paid jobs, right? So instead of people having to like dig the turnips out of their own backyard and chop them up and boil them and make them into, I was gonna say turnip paste, nobody eats that. Um, we can, we can have small businesses, local businesses, and they can be built around different ownership models. So we could have local cooperatives that grow food and prepare food, and then local delivery companies that come and deliver them to your door in green and sustainable vehicles, right? And, and, and there's no reason why these industries need to be gendered. These can be, we can encourage all different people to get involved in these industries. So if you're boiling nappies on the hob, don't. You've got your dirty nappies, put them in a bin. That can be a whole industry. We give that to a sustainable local cooperative. They can take those nappies away and boil them for you and bring them back. And we can, we can turn these jobs that seem, well, jobs that are pretty, pretty, they're not very glamorous. Boiling nappies on the hob is not very glamorous, but we can turn that into industry and into, into successful and, and sustainable employment for people. Um, speaking to the, the um, decrease in growth, does this mean degrowth? Um, I think that the focus on growth is not, not the focus that we need. Again, this is talking about what is our economy for? Our economy certainly isn't for growth at, at the sake of growth. I think this is a bit of a, of a I don't know, this, this argument's been going on and on and on for ages, right? I think what's important is that we are living within our planetary boundaries, that we are supporting um, good, well-paid, fulfilling work, and that we are ensuring a decent quality of life for, for, for citizens, right? So um, that may well mean that we need to drastically reduce consumption, but I, I don't think it's, it's, it's helpful to talk about, to focus on growth is the main important thing. I think the most important thing is focus on the health of our environment and the health of our society. Thank you, May. Denisha, would you like to come in next? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so I think um, one of the questions was, what would the effect of putting 18 billion, I think that relates to the COVID and the CCFF um, scheme into the economy, what effect it would have on the macro economy. Um, this, um, I mean, the way to look at this, I think, is that we're in a deep recession and um, direct spending into the economy is going to support jobs, is going to, um, depending on what schemes we, whichever scheme we want to look at, the furlough or whatever, it's going to protect jobs. It can go towards protecting people who are um, piling up debts 
become, that are becoming unsustainable, um, protecting um, industries that are critical to um, the wider society, um, helping us shift to new patterns of demand, because that is actually going to be happening. We're going to be working more from home, potentially. Um, some industries are going to be closing down. Some new industries are going to be taking their place. And we want to be able to um, sort of strategically plan that transition process so that it is in industries that are sustainable, that provide um, good quality jobs that are well paid, um, or at least, you know, living wage paid, um, and um, fix issues like the under-resourcing of the NHS and the social care system. Um, and so um, it could, the question was, it would probably have been very beneficial for the macro economy in terms of the fact that we're in a very unusual recession and that's going to really reshape the way our economies are run. It would help us strategically and um, transformatively shape that change and that recession So and the recovery. So I think... Um, you know, the other side of this is that we have a lot of spare capacity because we're in a recession. Uh, aggregate demand is extremely low. It's collapsing, as is um, people's incomes. And, um, you know, it's going to be a sort of downward spiral unless we, we do something about that. Um, I think uh, the other question might have been about reimagining the financial system. And I think that's a really important um, point. Um, something else that we... Um, haven't been talking as much about because of the sort of immediate concerns around COVID and the response to COVID is the fact that um, decades of deregulation in the financial sector has made it kind of a, such a dominant industry that determines a lot of what politics we follow. It, it, it determines policy um, decisions and um, also how we live our lives effectively because we take on more debt through the financial sector. Um, and um, it's often used against us of why we can't regulate the sector because it's too valuable to us. So we need to take away our dependence on that financial sector and make sure that it serves people rather than we're serving the financial sector. So I think, yes, there does need to be a reimagining on a bit um, of it. And we need to make sure that we sort of start focusing on greening the financial sector, but also um, regulating it better. Thank you, Denisha. Tatana, do you want to speak to any of those um, questions? Um, I, th I think both panelists have covered most of it. The only thing to say, I suppose, from my end is, um, the concerns, often the concerns around direct monetary financing of deficits uh, is to do with inflation. Um, but from what I've gathered so far, that concern isn't here or is going to be here anytime soon. Um, I can't explain why. I do not know why. Perhaps my, my other co-panelists might know better. But uh, from what I read and what I'm understand from my colleagues at, 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 at NEF, um, concerns around um, inflation as we speak today are blown out of proportion. In fact, there's a bigger concern of potential deflationary spiral compared to uh, anything around inflation. So I think that's the question that comes up, at least in, in my understanding uh, of general public discourse around direct monetary financing of, of public debt. Um, the question of inflation. I don't think we ought to be worried about it at this stage. Thank you, everyone. Um, there are so many questions flowing in here. I'm doing my very best to, to get a grip on them all, but we've got time for just two more, I think. So um, a cheery one from Blaze, which says, is it, is it likely our country will go bankrupt in the next 12 months? and normal people, i.e. not the corporates, will lose their own money. And then a second question from Adrian, which is how likely can direct monetary financing be achieved as advocated in today's talk without any change to the central banker's mandate? Um, so final couple of questions there before we'll move into um, the conclusion. Um, so, Denisha, um, can I go to you first on those questions? Um, yeah, so um, are we going to come bankrupt in the next year? I think, um, no, I think this question normally, um, or variations on this question normally is because people fear we're going to end up like Greece. 
Um, and the truth is we, we can't end up like Greece because um, Greece didn't, doesn't have its own currency. Um, it depends on the um, European, the Eurozone and the European Central Bank. Um, and we don't have that problem. So no, we're not going to go bankrupt. But I do think private debt, again, is a problem. Lots of people and businesses are going to default or go bankrupt and will be struggling, um, which is going to draw out the recovery for a very long time. So that is something we need to keep an eye on. Um, and in terms of the central bank's mandate, um, yes, I think um, it's something Positive Money has been um, trying to push for and advocate for much more, but the um, better coordination, more transparent and accountable coordination between the central bank and the treasury would allow us to um, you know, ensure the direct monetary financing could be a, a tool in the box that we can use. But actually, um, even though mixed messages have been coming out from the Bank of England over this past sort of several months, the truth is they have said that a lot of things are on the table for them that never were before. So things like negative interest rates, they're looking into it. Um, they've opened up the, the expanded and extended the um, government's overdraft facility, which is a, a form of monetary, um, direct monetary financing. So it's there, but I think mixed messages coming out of the Bank of England um, need to um, need to change. They need to be more transparent and accountable to people in that respect. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that answers it. Chaitanya or May, would you like to come in? Again, I think Denise has covered, covered the, the response quite well. Um, I suppose implicit in the point around the fact that we cannot go bankrupt is, is another case for greater public investment, I suppose, um, um, and, and further borrowing there. So that never is, is a worry, uh, as far as I understand, and Denisha's example in the past around how much um, deficit we accrued post-World War II is another example. So yeah, just repeating the fact that that's not a possibility which means that we can actually do more uh, in terms of uh, public investment. Again, I don't really have much to say that's relevant, but before it ends, I just want to give a quick shout out to the local. I want to just, we've talked a lot about the central bank, about government, and I think that the, there's a lot to be said about what we can be doing locally and how we can be generating and building wealth locally. And as Denisha says, we've got lots of small businesses that are going to be going out of business. And this is, this is, this is not good um but it is an opportunity to build workers cooperatives to take over some of these firms that might have gone bust and build and generate wealth locally using um look at using the support of local authorities using the support of local institutions that are embedded in the area um and yeah i think that the national and the international is obviously super important but i think in these times of covid where I don't know, final nail in the coffin of globalization. We need to be looking locally and looking at how we can um yeah build things on a local scale. A really important point to end on and bring in. Thank you for bringing that in, Maeve. Um, and that brings us to the conclusion of um, of this webinar. So um, I just want to say a really huge thank you again to our speakers for all of the expertise and energy that you've brought to today's um, webinar. This is a really important and fundamental conversation. Um, it's become clear that we really need to reframe what our economy is for. Is it for the health and environment um, as opposed to the importance of balancing the books that just isn't really important um, and that we need to change this narrative around how governments can spend money so private debt is problematic and high we're in a deep recession but public debt is quite low in historic levels and we need to recognize that underinvestment by government is is not good for our economy we've also heard um, about the technicalities of, of how some of this how some how the, pub, the state can fund um, what it needs to, and then at the end there we heard about the importance of community wealth building, uh, different ownership models at the local level, and drawing on local institutions and perhaps different forms of banking models. Um, so 
The full video of this webinar will be on our YouTube channel probably by the end of today, but at the at tomorrow morning at the latest, and it's already on Facebook as well. This was the third and final of our webinars in our autumn series. The first was how racism built our money and banking system. The second was debt inequality and COVID-19, the perfect storm. And obviously today has been building back better with the magic money tree. You can see all of them on the Positive Money's YouTube channel. We're hopeful to do another series of webinars um, early in the, next, in the new year. Um, but for now, I just want to say a big, big thank you again to our speakers and to everybody who joined and submitted questions today. Thank you all so much.